Okay, so this is co-production of knowledge that we are going to be doing. Um, as a point of departure, perhaps I thought what we can do is start by, um, and then perhaps build on that, is start with the obviously pre-colonial, is to talk about the word pre-colonial and find um, other methods by which to start referring to the pre-colonial so that we are not obviously fixed on the word itself. So perhaps if you can just use the microphone in front of you and just indicate what your thoughts have been on transforming and um, or otherwise rethinking the word pre-colonial itself um, as a term. Obviously we have had in different fields, in different disciplines, we have had debates about terms such as, for example, pre-historical or pre-history, uh, pre-modern, um, and all those terminologies in the context of African history, anthropology, and archaeology have been debated. Um, we have had to deal with other kinds of terminology, for example, the Middle Ages. Do we use the term Middle Ages to refer to Africa in the 1100s? Um, Christopher Arad comes up with the word African Classical Age. So we can name things um, to suit our conceptual needs. Somebody wants to make a comment? Yes, Karen. Okay. Thanks very much, Nogalando. One of the uh, things that we've been trying to do in our, our research projects is every, every time the temptation arises to refer to something as the pre-colonial, we've stopped and said, we've, we've stopped and said, what are we, what does the writer, whoever the writer is or the person who's speaking, what are they actually referring to? So I think that we felt that the problem isn't replacing the pre-colonial with an, one other term, but deciding what you're actually trying to talk about and then finding a way of being able to name that appropriately according to how you understand whatever it is. Well, that, that's my point. So. <laughs> so sometimes you're talking about the late, if we sometimes find that we're talking about periodization, and we yes, periodization. specify a late independent period. Sometimes you're talking about a heyday, and then it requires a different word. So I think there's a lot of words instead of this one problematic yes. catch-all. So instead of replacing the word, you must think specifically what is it that you are looking at. So if I looked at the, the, seven, the, late, the, the late 1700s into the 1800s, um, I might be looking at the, 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 the I don't know, the, the period of, of Imidange. I don't know, I'm just thinking. I'm looking at people that might know his Eastern Cape history better than I. Um, so instead of saying, instead of talking simply pre-colonial, just assert the particular phase that you are looking at in the history. That's what you're saying. Yeah. And, and I think it's sometimes worth trying to find a language for periodization, but sometimes you're trying to find a language for a phenomenon or a, a, a feature, a, a characteristic. So you know, I think it really does depend. Okay, um, can I, okay, so that one, that one, that one point of view. Um, in terms of periodization, however, um, would it not uh, still, though, make some kind of um, sort of African scholarly sense to, or South, Southern African scholarly sense to just sort of um, put, put some, some generic terms in place just for, 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 for the purposes of, of, um, of having the same 
kind of uh, terminologies uh, so we understand, right? So when people, for example, I, you know, if you talk about the Fekta and the period, right? I don't have a problem anymore with referring to to Fekta and per se. Um, of course, others will have a problem with that. Um, but when you talk about Mfetla and the period, in, in that sense, you're not uh, simply talking about the actions of whites, but you're also talking about the broader um, context in which African um, um, Africans are acting within the context of this white invasion. So, I mean, if you were to write a school textbook, is what I'm saying. If you had to put chapters in the school textbook for South African history, um, which many of us at some point have to do, you know, when the state calls on you to do that, um, can we break up? Can we? Can we? Can we give ourselves that challenge? But let's look at South Africa. Let's not. Let's forget about everyone else for now. How do we? How do we do it? So let's. If we were to start, for example, I mean, we can talk about the hominid era. Okay, to talk about everything up to Homo erectus, um, or up to Homo, up to just before Homo sapiens sapiens, and then after that we can talk about a different era. So, if you were just to write a school textbook of the past four million years, how would we periodize that four million years uh, for standard curricular instruction? <laughs> I think let's start. Let's challenge ourselves like that. So, how would we do that? In the sense that you're saying, so in the sense of saying, assert what it is you are talking about. So yes, okay, with, let's leave pre-colonial, but let's write the periods. Let's give them names that are that are different, or not different, but that are more concerned with with the actions of uh, the, the, the 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 indigenous. Or, We are writing a school textbook now. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry, at the risk of talking a little bit too much. I, I well, know. it's open to anyone. But I'll, I'll throw out what I try and work with, and let's maybe we can see whether, you know. I find uh, it's very clear, I think, that something happens around, now I can't put the date on it, so I would require others to help me, but around 1100 or so, where we start seeing really big substantial kingdoms across the region emerging. Mm -hmm. These really substantial aggregations. So it feels to me that there's a, a certain marker there that I like to recognize, mm -hmm. sort of independently from this idea of the later Iron Age, which I find flat and unhelpful yes. and so on. So I, I, like to be, I would like to be able to name the phenomenon of the growth of the big kingdoms. And it seems that you know, that stretches right forward Yes. But then it appears to me that it's useful to specify that in the late, the late part of that period, that which I've been referring to, but I'm not sure I'm quite happy with it. But I've been referring to it as the late independent period, is is when when these big kingdoms are having to grapple with the beginnings of a a, a white presence. Yes. I, okay. So I find I see two things there yes. that strike me, yeah. the actual way of name, and then I think you're right about the Invictani period, that, you know, then it goes into a period in which there are upheavals, yeah. and the debates about the reason for the upheavals, yeah. but the upheavals seem to be there, yeah. so they need to be named. May I request that people also consider all of this in the vernacular, in the idiom, so if there's a way of talking about the pre-colonial not in English, so, um, I mean, the, the, I suppose in Gesulu, the broad term for history or the past would be Emandulu. But that is the, 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 the pre, that's the past in a very also mythical sense. Mandulu can also be a, a, a mythical, unperiodized past that, in which time actually isn't a, 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 an issue. So, um, so part of it, I think, is also conceptualizing things not merely in the purely historical point of view, uh, with the historical mindset, but also with the, with the, with an idiomatic and a literary uh, approach. Uh, for example, how does one talk about human ancestors before humans? 
but in the vernacular. So if you want to talk about the that so one of the things we have to do is the conversation I'm having I was having with Denver is we have to reclaim somehow as Africans the prehistory from the scientists. <laughs> we have to claim because for example yesterday two things were clear to me from the presentation of the zoologist. The first is that the practice of ochre painting in Africa is 200,000 years old. It has not stopped. It has not stopped. Africans continue with this cultural practice of using the ochre cosmetically in the Eastern Cape. So there's a continuity from those early ancestors that the scientists in many ways see as distinct from us. The second was the, the, the food production method of foraging on the, um, on the intertidal zone. If you go anywhere along the Eastern Cape Coast and up the way to KZN, you will know that people harvest in Baza by looking at Inyaga, looking at the moon. So she spoke about that as if it's completely alien to present-day Africans. No, it isn't. Present-day Africans know by looking at the moon that when they must go and harvest. Young people that live on the coast in the Eastern Cape can tell you that practice in the idiomatic sense of how they know when by the moon it is right to go uyoka in Baza. I'm not sure what the precise term is in this Tosa, but in Baza are muscles. So in, claim, in, in, in thinking of the pre-colonial, you see the scientists are doing something to us right now, which is that species language where it's like there's the natural origins and then there's a cultural origins they can't see the continuities for africans of those practices so she said yesterday you will remember today i and she's talking as a white woman i look up at the stars that is something which clearly those early ancestors passed on to us as a, as a species and I'm thinking, if you went to Dues and Kwanam Sanja, Abandu, they're still looking up at the stars to figure out the intertidal zone by Irid. <laughs> that's, how, that's what I was thinking. So, so I've just I've put down those cultural histories. So there's the problem of the later Iron Age. So to think about those African kingdoms, how would we name that? Um, and I've put here late independent period, which I kind of like. And I've also put him fit on a period because that comes after the late independent period. So I've put that there. I like that because I can see in a history textbook for school children that they would then understand what the late independent period is. It's probably the 15, 1600s. It's the era of Nzinga, Mabudu, um, just, you know, maybe just before, just before Shaka. Of Ngonde, uh, maybe Ngonde a bit too early, maybe of um, Nduandwe. In the Eastern Cape, of some of the pre conquered chiefs, you can see that. So I like late independent period to refer to the 16 and 1700s. Does everybody like that? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe not. For now, can we hold it as a, as a marker? Uh, so, okay, sorry, I'm. Uh, yeah, but anyway, I'm also I'm very interested in colleagues. Uh, 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 sorry, in response to your question about what about in the vernacular. Mm. I've, I've often thought about the word umlando mm. and I, I'm, my linguistic skills are not uh, fine here so I would be very interested to know whether the term takes us towards narration Ugulanda. Ugulanda. and if it does is there something about the past the a certain part of the past that we're trying to name is available still and to us through through narration and that there's a certain past in which narration f starts to fade out mm. and other things have to come in uh, and that's that's when you we start talking about a, a more figured and imagined past so i'm 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 too un uncertain about the linguistics involved here or the, the appeal of the term but it, uh, it is something that i've thought about yeah. Okay. Um, Just use the, if you can. Marcus Garvey said in the 1960s at the United Nations, and I quote, 
until the color of a man's skin is of no more significance than the color of his eyes, I say war, unquote. Bob Marley made a song called War on that thing. I think as long as our discussions is based on skin color, we will never get beyond a certain way of understanding our world. I agree with both Garvey and also Bob Marley. I propose to the way and I put it forward, what I call uh, the universal and the local. So universally, as, as beings, we share certain things which, which are common to all of us, like looking at the moon, looking at the stars, for example, you use that example, and dealing you with your... Putting on your... Just put on the yeah, sorry. And dealing with your term of the vernacular... Um, I don't know, wait, I'm oh, sorry. And dealing with the term of the vernacular, that is a term that is also universal. But in the local, the vernacular is um, interpreted uh, in a local sense, what every place in the world, how they relate to that. So these are terms that we, we share, because we're talking about terminology now, and we, have, we are discussing a classification uh, in certain terms. So um, in the universal, there are certain things that uh, we share, as I said, and in the local, in the local, if you're talking about the kingdoms, that is also a, a universal uh, phenomena amongst human beings, the kingdoms and that. But how is that? How does that uh, manifest itself in the local? And then you start dealing with different cultures and uh, and, th and things like that. For instance, um, if due to a lack of, of another word, if we can call one culture, the one culture of the Bushmen, for instance. In the Bushmen culture, there does not exist the concept of ownership. It's, this is non-existent. The other cultures that the Bushmen culture came in contact with have a concept of ownership. And this put these two cultures in a different um, uh, um, situation, ideologically, how, how do they see the world? For instance, um, another thing coming, dealing with skin color, as human beings, none of us ask to be born. We are born within a society, within a culture and that. And children don't have any concept of, 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 of um, uh, xenophobia. They don't have that. that. That concept is culturally transmitted from the older people to the younger generation. And unless we address uh, uh, the way the older people think, see the world, we'll never get out of this uh, problem uh, of dealing with cultures in terms of that. Okay, I know it's a problematic thing, and I don't need to. F I don't, don't ho hope I offend anybody what I said, but uh, okay. Okay. Um, how, how does that? Okay. Do so we're dealing here with the universal and the local, that, that's understood. The issue is how do we um, have to, so with that in mind, we have to, in trying to um, develop further understandings of the past, then still come up with um, conceptual pathways that allow us to, to, to make new understandings of the past. So, so I mean, I think the, 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 that the, the point is, is, is taken. So how do we use that? How do we uh, use that? Just click there, my design on your. Just use that understanding that of universal, local, and try to further our and our conceptualizing of this pre-colonial past. I hear what you're saying, but I'm trying to get us to be concrete. Otherwise, Ellen will say I would have failed in my job. Thank you. Um, I think generally. There's general agreement that pre-colonial was encompassing a wide historical age or period, and it was just shown as one dark mass or mass. I think it's M A S S mass. But perhaps we need to get out of that box and realize that there will have to be period periodization and we need not panic about being upfront about that. It was not that pre-colonial as a concept was the right and accepted style of describing a particular period. Otherwise, we, we lose a lot of um, 
trends and developments that are traceable and some are mythical. And perhaps thinking as historians, we could have a kind of a subdivision at mytho-historical era. Okay, interesting. So, yeah. And then, then we can then move on. I, I see almost breaking uh, uh, into four, and then give um, uh, headings or, or themes on this. Otherwise, we are going to uh, lose our track once we are stuck on, on pre-colonial. Myth of, uh, if I can, uh, historical era is important in African um, notion of history. Because if we take in so Nekwane, which are written off by Western historiography, in Afro historiography, in Zomi actually lay a foundation to historical thinking, not just for the idea of history, but for the making of historical consciousness. So we, 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 so we would like to, even if we're uh, leading in our children and even adults, we would like to lead them into that kind of thinking. Because even in everyday language, Africans talking jump from insomni to what I would call living time. And it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Uh, Professor Dente. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Mkise. I just forget the gentleman's name here, but Ernst, he's mentioning... Ernst. 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 Yeah. Ernest. Ernest. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. He's making a very important point about speaking, you know, the need to speak beyond color. But even as we do so, this must be done within a context. Of course. It's very important. Of course. Because the reality of the matter is that we cannot ignore the existence of color for good or bad reasons. The reality of the matter is that there are white people and black people, right? But the reality of the matter even then is that on the basis of that, other people advantage themselves and disadvantage others. So therefore, I'm listening, for instance, and um, you know, my style is being open and frank and direct. I can't afford to be diplomatic. Namalanga keeps on making reference to whiteness and blackness and all that. Um, she can't do otherwise because from her own experience, being black has positioned her in a particular way in life, and being white has positioned others in a particular way. So sometimes I get this feeling um, on the part of progressive white people, because they refer to themselves as such, that there is anxiety and haste to move beyond the issue of the color. And again, that becomes the burden of the black person, you know, to quickly move beyond this. Um, so if then, you know, there's this haste towards speaking in racial terms. Um, let white people make a conscious decision and um, a serious commitment. And, and that needs to be done amongst themselves. Um, because, you know, we, we have made our, our, our we, have, we have played our role in moving beyond. We conceptualize terms like non-racialism, anti-racism and all that. We even spoke about human race, the human race, where others, you know, in their own language taught us about racism and racialism and everything else. So um, these issues then are important. For instance, I listen, and, and I don't think that you're doing it maliciously, but because of your positioning in society, um, uh, in terms of race, uh, in that, your language and all that, you keep on referring to the term Bushman, right? I, I said, I don't know, I don't have another please, term. Please hold, please hold on, please hold on. Um, you keep on making reference to that word, Bushman, and you're speaking about Bushmen as if they exist in separation from the rest of them. Please hold. Let's and this another debate. thing that Let's have the debate. And this is another issue that we, we've got to, to understand about ourselves and in terms of our culture and cultures that uh, we learn that um, you know even if you disagree with the person while that person is speaking, you allow that person to say whatever he or she needs to say until she or he finishes and then thereafter. I think that's another issue. It's a cultural issue because amongst us there is a conscious lesson and teaching that uh, when one is having is making a point you know, the other leads to listen to another until the other, you know, finishes. Um, and so these kinds of issues then 
um, we need to, you know, to be practical about them and to be sensitive when engaging with them. Otherwise, we're not going to make progress. Um, can I just get a sense if anyone who hasn't spoken? Yes, thank you. Oh, you, you, you finished, Professor. Yes, I have. Thank thanks, thanks. thanks. For now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, Professor, I took my, my words on that the issue of uh, naming uh, like Bushmen, but I would like to take the opportunity to make a contribution on the reality of Mozambique on a words that have a um, negative connotation that were constructed under the, the relation between uh, Europeans and Africans, Europeans and Mozambicans. We have a word that is uh, indigenous. It's like um, uh, indigenous culture. We, no, we don't accept the use of indigenous culture. Other people, other countries, they accept the use of uh, indigenous, has to refer the local communities. We, don't, we are not comfortable with this, and we, in the process of uh, many um, academic writings and even in school books, we are not using the word indigenous because, because it carries um, a negative connotation. When we go to dictionary, it means other things. But for us in our psychological mind in Mozambique, indigenous uh, culture, indigenous people, it means uh, um, a, a, a lower, yes. a, 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 an underground people that are not civilized because of the way that this word was constructed uh, by the Portuguese government. It was just a contribution. And to, be, to take care of all these aspects when we think on naming and making periodization and talk about the, the, the culture of uh, Africans, of uh, Mozambicans or South Africans. I, I think uh, there are a, a couple of people I noted who, who uh, even Mamdesan in your thesis, you don't use the word indigenous. I think you use that much longer word, or oh, top tones or whatever, <laughs> which I can never pronounce. Oh, no, no. Thank oh, you. Oh, no. um, what is the word that you are using in Mozambique in the place of indigenous? Uh, we named the cultures. Oh, you just named yeah. it? Yeah, Changana oh, is uh, Shana. Uh, yeah. yeah, we recognize the diversity of the yeah. cultures and uh, yeah. we, we name the cultures. Yeah, and how do you refer when you are trying to refer to the invasion of everyone? So, in relation to, to the Portuguese, how do you, so do you simply just say Mo, uh, Mozambique? Mozambicans. Mozambicans. Mozambicans, because of course there's a, 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 a discussion on academic uh, environment and society environments of the presence of the issues of race yeah. between whites and blacks. But we always make an effort to recognize that Mozambique is not a thing linked to the, yeah. the skin color. Yeah, yeah. It's not a skin color. And it's, this comes from the, the talks from the liberation movement of Mozambique. Has Eduardo Mondlane touched us during the formation of the Frelimo? Uh, Frelimo had uh, people with, uh, with white skin color uh, fighting in, on side of Frelimo for the liberation. So there is no issue of, um, of, uh, of being white or being black. They are Mozambicans. The things that we have to be always aware of that this relation between Mozambicans that are black and white, they don't have to remind us colonization. On the, on the behaviors of the people. Uh, we have on our minds uh, a, a frame of how uh, we build the relations between blacks and, uh, and whites. So the present day relation, they don't have to remind us. Uh, they don't have to be, uh, they, we, we don't want to see racism. Yeah. We don't want to, to see advantage of the white people. Uh, we, don't want, we don't want to see that uh, uh, black people are, are, are oppressed. That's why it's not an issue of color. It's an issue of how we build our relations on the present day. It's interesting because I think part of the slight difference of South Africa might be simply that they are far more white settled in South Africa that continuously called for a distinction to be made. And um, it might, so, so, so the, the, the most, uh, but I think it's a, it's a good point for South Africans to consider. The other thing is South Africans, in writing themselves are likely to not refer to themselves as South Africans because if they do that, it has a tendency of accepting 1910, the, 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 the South African, the coming together of white South Africa. So South Africans have a tendency of rejecting, unless of course if they are Pan-Africanists and then they completely refer to themselves as Azanians, 
which is still some. So perhaps the concept of Azania needs to be re yeah needs to be resurrected because even I grew up with the concept of of Azania. So South Africans tend to reject South Africa as a naming. Um, or that by that I mean black South Africans. So they wouldn't write that back into their history. But the concept of using the clan names or the ethnic group designation is probably something that South Africans need to think about more in a more disciplined way. Because I think that's probably something we don't do quite so well. Because we turn back to the term indigenous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At, at the back there. Um, I'll, I'll just talk loudly. Um, <coughs> thank you, Professor Sasanti. Um, I think that your very clear articulation of the issues is, is so valuable. Um, again, in South Africa, obviously, there were people involved, white people involved in the liberation struggle too, um, but probably far too few. Um, but what I wanted to, if I can change the conversation a little bit back to your original um, questions around history. Um, I'm, a, I'm a designer, uh, so I have no, no real, I have, I'm extremely ignorant effectively, but I wanted to pose the question, do we want to create a, or is there value in creating a linear timeline versus one which is more integrated? In other words, um, a more uh, thematic or circular or whatever that is, which 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 doesn't create such a linear kind of space. I just wondered if there was if there was movement there or, or yeah. I'm posing the question. Yeah. Am, am I okay? okay? No, it's fine. Yeah. Let me go back to Matisani's uh, comment about mythical uh, also umlando, umlando, imbali, umbaliza. Let's go back to that because I think that is a powerful. In, in English, it's a pity we have to put it in English. The mythical historical era is quite foundational to understanding Greek history. You almost cannot encounter Greek history if you do not go back to Homer. Yeah. And yet it is acceptable <laughs> for Greeks to do it that way. I want us to have that discussion. I'm sorry to invoke the Greeks all the time because unfortunately they are so dominant in the Western historiography and they are an example of how the mythical historical period is considered foundational to understanding the historical period. I mean, to this day, they are still excavating, trying to find Troy. Because of that, they are still trying to find Troy. Now, and then, you know, so that, that whole, the whole, so that leads to your question around, in fact, how you write histories that are, are, are integrated. And I think it has to do with the, the bifurcation in South Africa between African literature and African history is actually the problem. You never can study Greek history without studying Greek literature. People don't take you seriously. Somebody name me a course in which you can do Greek history without having to understand even Greek. <laughs> Where can you study Greek history, which is considered almost foundational to European history because of the so-called philosophical advances? You cannot do it without having to do demos and so on. So it is possible, it's just that our curricula refuse to allow it because of we have to separate Africans out even intellectually to the degree that they cannot match their historical consciousness from the mytho, mytho historical period to the... So if I was writing this textbook, so I'm taking all your notes every comment, and well, not all your comments, but I'm taking all your suggestions. So if I'm writing the textbook, you must deal with the mythical historical period so that students and learners can come to grips with the concepts and terms. So untu. Untu is a very important concept. I just cannot imagine being expected to study Greek without understanding Sophia. Wisdom. Why must I learn that word? Because otherwise I don't understand philosophy, or <laughs> why it matters. So, undu is a very important word. Now the trouble of course is that we need to find ways to make these words um, multilingual in terms of the various African idioms. So we need, for example, the, the ones from the, the same nomenclature. So that, that work that needs to come from the, the the Khoisan languages, is, it's, 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 or the San languages in particular, it needs to be done because we need that mythical, historical 
understanding of 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 of, of you, you know what I mean? Does that I don't does that make sense? So if we do that, we literally need to go back to all the shared conceptions of first principles that various Africans and and and, and some of the even more in, 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 entrenched um, African uh, cosmologies give to us. So I am interested in that book, although it's now in Afrikaans. Um, I suppose we'd have to go to Namibia because I think Namibians are better at giving it to us in the in the in the indigenous language or this, let's, the, the, the 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 whichever language. <laughs> okay, but I think we we need to build a relationship closely with Namibians. I'm going to put that down as a point of of concrete. Well, it was in Southern. Yes. We're Southern, yeah. Yeah, and now we've got Mozambique. What you are, what what you are saying that we consciously bring an Namibia in, we consciously bring Botswana in. Um, I was in a in a grouping of Southern Africans, and I found it stimulating and enriching. And strangely enough, I could see that people who were who did not grow up in apartheid South Africa, think differently. Very enriching and very enlightening and very encouraging and making one quite conscious of the burden that one carries. Yeah. I mean, already the challenge you posed to us about that term means that now it is my burden. I must now as a South African go and stand in Namibian history so that I don't just refer to this club of indigenous people. I must, you see, now we need that in our textbooks because what what this mythical uh, historical era does is that it helps construct the, the, the concepts, the concepts. So the erasure of the those um, mythical historical concepts is the erasure of Africans, in particular those who then suffered genocide in those early uh, encounters with the, with, the, with the Dutch and later the Germans. So somehow we need that work to be done. So I'm constructing the textbook here for our future African child. Not yet. Not, <laughs> not yet. Dutch, not a Dutch. Not, not even yet Dutch. Not yet Dutch. Mm. I would like to think that in little historical and then perhaps we for see what... Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> If he, and then if we're thinking of thematizing, then we look at um, how nature was domesticated or tamed. That is a big uh, step, I'd like to believe. Um, the taming of, of, of animals. And we've got these strange stories about trying to tame a zebra and them refusing. And Equally, trying to tame a lion when Amangala, the same Amanga here, when Amangesi were going, they, they, they took a cab of a lion and they thought that if they bring this one, they'll solve their problem. So there have been attempts of taming, um, whether it's for, for, for food or for energy production or, or, or whatever. Equally, the taming of crops and, 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 and then that eventually leads to sedentary, to divisions of, um, of, of production. Because some refuse to settle down. And it's a choice people make. Yes, Professor, I'll come to you. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Comrade Chen. You know, as uh, people are making inputs, something comes to mind and it is the title by Mahmoud Mandani, I think it says, the, late, the, the book before the latest, it is um, Define and Rule, right? It's a very important title, because what it means is that once you have defined mm -hmm. something, you've given it a name, mm -hmm. and Gugi Wationgo in his um, I write what I, no, 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 Writers in Politics uh, states what we know as Africans, that uh, naming in African culture is very important because naming establishes a relationship. Um, not only does it do that, it also establishes for those who are in power a sense of ownership. 
but at the same time it establishes a sense of dispossession for the others let me quickly illustrate two points and sit down um, today in in africa and and strangely and tragically in fact um, africans gang against one another in the african union on the basis of their of their past colonial, colonial masters there is french africa there is anglo africa there is lusophone africa and africans have accepted you know that uh, they relate to one another on the basis of what their masters imposed upon them and so not only does it desensitize the the oppressor it also desensitized the desensitizes um, the oppressed um, and another example again right in the african union um, when your former president uh, du um, joachim chisano joachim chisano um, came to the meeting of the african union and began to speak kiswahili uh, people turned around and were surprised and said what because at that time in the african union the official languages were english french and arabic no african language in an african institution and so therefore when we discuss these things we've got to historically concretize them because they are not merely abstraction and merely intellectual issues that uh, you know are not concretely and have no concrete experience so therefore in sitting down uh, at sitting down um, when we, we look at pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial, perhaps we need to understand if we are used those, those, those concepts, for what reason? Because um, um, we must never, and this is a serious mistake upon us, those of us who participate in the revolutionary struggles, is that we tend to, to want to, to forget things that are felt by others as discomforting. We must never forget colonialism, never. We must never forget slavery, never. And we must give those their names and say that there was once colonialism because if we dare try to forget, it will come back to haunt us again. I agree with uh, the professor said. I just want to, I was put in a situation Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I agree no, with the. Just someone behind you. Okay, sorry. You. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, apologies. I think my question is um, slightly related to what Professor Sisanti, I hope I got to say it right, um, was talking about. In, in our quest to name and um, rename periods and, and events that have taken place, I'm just a bit worried that. We shouldn't entrench the South African exceptionalism that currently exists, right, that disconnects us from the rest of the continent. Because I think that is so prevalent even in, you know, how we study um, from our curricula. I recently found out about Lucifer in Africa, you know, because of, I don't know if it was by my own ignorance or what, but it's just, we, we tend to monor to monotolize Africa, right? And we end up not actually you know, looking at Francophone Africa, Lusophone Africa, you know. So I'm just worried that maybe not continue the entrenchment of South African exceptionalism. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Here at the front. Yeah, I just want to, just want to say I agree with what um, the professor said, uh, what, what you said. I also just want to say that I don't see myself as a white progressive. Um, uh, but and I'm also well aware of what, what you were saying, and I'm not trying to suggest to hasten a process. I was just saying what you said in the beginning, that we have to be aware uh, of what, 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 what we were dealing with, and with respect. Thank you. And I think we should maybe come back to the theme that, that you started with, uh, to uh, find a way of, um, yeah. Um, I'm taking down all your notes and somehow I will attempt to make it coherent as far as possible and then we'll discuss whether it makes sense. Uh, professor at the back. Thanks, Carlos. Uh Not being a trained historian, I'm a bit uh, limited. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, 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 I really appreciate uh, and want to accentuate the, the, the point about about letting go of terms that gives primacy to a sided 
interrogation of history. I mean, when you, when you the pre-colonial, uh, colonial is the norm, kind of. So it's like everything else is relegated to the margins. And it's like, this is where this thing starts with colonial, then everything else is just, as you were saying, uh, Dr. Tisai. I, 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 like, I like Caroline's suggestion that uh, we, we affirm the subject that we are studying and defining it independent of the colonial. Then that focuses attention on that issue per se. It gives it, it, gives it identity. It accentuates it. Uh, but my, my limitation, uh, I suppose, is, is then going back to tabulate a whole number of subjects of subject that fall within that period. Uh, I think the major issue for me would be, and, and what I'm kind of taking off here is that, is the, is the acceptance of the idea that what we are studying must, must be given its own independent identity, independent of the colonial and affirm its, its utility uh, in its own right. Then the subject becomes for, or rather the task becomes for later uh, deliberations is then how do you break it down into the various subjects in terms of prioritization. Uh, I also accept the, the point you were saying that I mean history doesn't unfold in a unilinear fashion. These, these, these events these periods do kind of intermingle and influence each other. Uh, yeah, thanks. Let me just put a couple of points of consideration forward based on some of your comments. Um, so, does anybody know, sorry, when the session ends? Yeah. At 11, okay. We are, we are, we've got some time. Let me just put some, some questions forward um, based on what you've said. Um, I'll start from Ayand. Okay, so we've got You've got, a, you've got some tensions here that are going to arise. On the one hand, you don't want South Africa to be exceptional. So you must not divorce South Africa. As my colleagues will say, Africa is it's, it's Africa is Africa. We share historical, and that's what Sheikh and Diop argues. <coughs> you know, don't even have to, you know. As my father sometimes says, did any of our ancestors cross oceans to get here? Okay, it gets you into tangles, that one, but <laughs> I like the concept at a basic level. But the issue is, how um, do you deal with the fact that actually different pockets of Africa have different historical periods of their own that you need to recognize distinctively? You can't collapse Southern Africa's individual developments with, say, West Africa's individual developments. So also, South African exceptionalism is not about exceptionalizing. It's actually about acknowledging this historical development. You've got to accept that Iron Age reaches West Africa, say, 800 or 500 BC. That's, we know that. It's OK. There's no problem. We can't say uh, Iron Age necessarily um, arrives in Southern Africa or you know, prior to that, I, I mean, there's no point <laughs> until we, we, we find out if you know, it does, but there's no point. I mean, it, we, we are happy that the West Africans, you know, or the uh, West Africans had, you know, served furnaces by up to 500 before the birth of Christ. It's okay. In the same way that we're okay that the Chinese you know, uh, we're in the Bronze Age and Africa didn't, <laughs> except for certain parts of, uh, you know, North Africa. Large parts of Africa didn't use bronze in the way that the, the East did. It's okay. So, exceptions are actually, in fact, the, 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 the joy. Uh, they're not exceptions. But on the other hand, um, you don't want South Africa's history to be completely separated from the broader trend. So, the, the, the thing then is to be able to be comfortable with regionalizing aspects of our histories so that we understand where the relations are and where they okay so that was one and then the other um, what was the other note here naming so just to, to think about that or oh, circular 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 thinking I think that was the, was the point I wanted us to think about that um, 
or the colonial and circular thinking. We have to be able to instill in our children somehow, Prof, that there are 3,000 years of civilization from, or 5,000 years of civilization, let's put it at 5,000, from uh, Kush upwards. They must be able to know that that happened all before Jesus Christ was born. <laughs> and that long history is as critical to us. So how we position the, the colonial in the story versus the absence of whiteness and colonialism is key. No, I don't understand what you're saying. Mm. I don't know why you are bringing in colonial. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what. I'm I mean, that's colonial. my point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So colonial doesn't come in the discussion, not that's colonial in the sense of from the 15th century with the coming of the white person. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about before. So let's not muddy this. Yeah. And I uh, and, and and personally, the the, the, the the earlier suggestion that we thematize uh, what we're doing, and then they come. The, there is a period where we know these things happened but we do not know when did they happen, but we know that they are part of our consciousness yes. and they are part of our looking back because yes. there is always a looking back. Yes. And then, 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 then for me that would be about uh, uh, two broad themes. Then we are going to come to original, originalization and then we're going to come to regionalization and for instance look at Egypt. And look at Egypt where the deity now is becoming to become modern in so far as the writing and dating are introduced. And then that is the beginning of an important but a different era. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that was essentially my point. Yes. That <coughs> I don't want to say mention the colonial no. in that story. No. <laughs> it no. shouldn't be that uh, that that must yeah. intervene. Yeah, that is exactly so. so yeah. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. Okay. We are on regionalization, and I'm wanting to follow you there mm -hmm. because of specific developments in particular regions. But what I'm saying is that we have left the concept of pre-colonial. We are giving birth, as the privileged people who give birth, we are giving birth to new concepts of a past, of a people, outside colonial experience, pre or post. So we come to regionalization, and regionalization we celebrate because we can actually geographically cover that northern part of Africa into the interior and we look at the ancient civilizations there and we, 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 we've got enough um, uh, in, information that we can scientifically put forward as the rest of the world. Perhaps we must also remember that we're talking to the rest of the world. Who would like to hear? Yes, Professor? Ma because I'm not uh, going to, but perhaps let, let, let me not, um, how do they say, let me not push in a disclaimer. Let me just say what I want to do. I, I appreciate the conundrum that Keys uh, um, Kabase um, is dealing with there. Um, for instance, several times yesterday, and this is an issue that uh, we have not really discussed, and it's an issue that we must seriously discuss. I remember at one stage, uh, Uka, about Professor Ndekian, was making reference to Amakopok, and I thought that uh, many Amakopok amongst us, you know, would begin to engage with this issue. For instance, you come from a background of, um, of, uh, of theology, and um, you know, the, the reality of the matter is that today when we speak, and comfortably so, we speak about, um, I listened to Kabbas that are trying to say before the common era, but very few people use that. Many people use before Christ, you know, as if our existence, like uh, Ukaba was saying, you know, we are centralizing colonialism in the same way that we are privileging, you know, uh, Christianity. And because many of us are Christians, we don't respond to that.
because we have been assimilated in that kind of environment and i'm using carefully words such as assimilated not integrated um because the truth of the matter is that christianity has also been used as an instrument um you know to to colonize the african people in many 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 ways never mind the fact that for when once sometimes we you know sometimes we say that the roots of christianity are in africa if that were the case or whether or not that is the case um how come then uh, christianity has been used in such a brutal way against the african people to this very day and the same applies to islam you know we must never forget um, today we are being, you know, made to feel, you know, especially with particular reference to those that are occupying the north, as if yesterday they did not brutalize the African people yeah. in the name of Islam. For instance, right in the history of Islam, you know, when they speak about, they term their period uh, after the Hijra, and their Hijra again is very selective. The first time the Muslims fled from Mecca, they fled to to what was then called Abyssinia. But that history is completely ignored by the Arab Muslims because they don't want to give credit to Africa. The Hijra that they speak about is the Hijra, the second Hijra that was in Medina, right? But you look at them when they date, when they periodize, periodize, periodize their history. It has got to do with Mecca and Medina. That is better than associating it with Africa. So we deal with those, you know, those are very difficult. It's between the, the, the rock and the hard place, and, but we've got to confront them. We, we've got to, we've got to, despite being, our, being, being Muslims that we have chosen to be, or despite being Christians that we have chosen to be, and say, how come? How come that, uh, you know, 1,362 years before the common era, and again being politically correct, we spoke monotheism right and jesus christ only came thereafter how come that even moses himself as the bible says chapter 7 verse 22 acts that moses learned his wisdom from 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 uh, from the people of Kemet? how come that now we are finding ourselves at the back of the line or the queue <laughs> okay i'm going to uh, i'm going to uh, respond and then we'll come around down Thank you. Do you want to debate? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I'm not questioning the point, but he is making general observations, which uh, I, 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 I would like to believe they are uh, understood and accepted and not even contested. But what I'm saying, why I'm saying, I'm saying, come to the point under discussion. The point under discussion is, what are we saying and how and as far as i'm concerned uh, um, i am thematizing in my mind and that is all i am doing now and i'm not contesting that yes. i'm not contesting that islam comes long after for the sense the point i put up about egypt because egypt is long before christ and the, the, the African kingdoms, Meroe, Azam, those uh, 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 kingdoms are long before Islam. So Adiko say Islam and the 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 I'm not there. I'm not, and I'm not contesting that we are coming there. Well, and and that period is already dated and is easily accessible in the documents. But we are looking at regions and civilizations that rose that we can trace and we are in north into central africa and we're going to be moving to west africa and looking at, at, at those civilizations and we will come to and that's why it's a regionalization let me go up there prof and then down to the other prof uh regionalization Similarity doesn't mean, doesn't apply uniformity. Um, I think the best way of understanding a phenomenon is to study it in its specificity. Uh, that is why you know, ethnography is always the best way and of doing things. Um, the universal is made up of multiple uh, parts. And the universal really gives a broader idea, but doesn't give you the granular details. Um, so, so otherwise, there would be no need really for the ethnography. 
will then accept that what pertains there pertains everywhere else because you all happen to occupy the continent of Africa. So I think we need to be clear on that. I mean, there, there's, let's take it as an established principle. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, I'm going to come down here. I'm worried I'm, I'm leaping out of the position we're in in the discussion, but I wanted to raise the point uh, which I'm quite troubled by, and I don't know how to express it properly, and that is the archaeologists' um, maintenance of the idea of the early Iron Age and the later Iron Age. Yeah. And the reason it worries me is I, I completely accept and see that when they excavate, they find evidence that they see stuff that they call the early Iron Age, and then they see different things, they get different things out of the ground, mm -hmm. and then they find the later Iron Age. And I, I see all of that. But I think that there's a whole way in which there's a sort of undercurrent of scholarship that has yet to bubble up that asks a question, I'm going to pose it rather crudely because we've got to get done by 11 o'clock, but it's kind of like, well, what happened to the early, so-called early Iron Age people? Where did they go? They're clearly here. I mean, they are some people's direct ancestors. So there's something, something that the, if we, as historians, if we accept what the archaeologists are doing and leave that part to them to periodize, we lose something fundamental. And so somehow in this periodization, we have to hang a question mark over how we want to handle what they're seeing. Because they're clearly seeing a different signature in the ground. Just give us a bit of uh, detail about that. So when we say early Iron Age, we're looking at, uh, in terms of the birth of Christ, are we saying, uh, are we looking at 500 years? Is it that period or the early sort of just at the turn of the, you know, millennium. Denver's ready to pronounce. Denver, please help us. In the, in the case of the Eastern Cape sites that they've excavated from uh, uh, a designer, they talk about the 6th and 7th centuries here, 7th yes. and 8th centuries. So that's more or less what they refer to as the early Iron Age in the Eastern Cape in their Okay, writings. just wh what regions are those? Um, or from around um, Dabangulu and then around East London, where the oh. sites have been excavated. That's what so they're they are about. finding early Iron Age type of evidence there. Yeah. And some of it, I think, goes back earlier, and they find similar stuff um, elsewhere in the country. So I can't, I'm, I'm a bit, I, you know, it's not really my area of expertise, and I can't say, but I think some of it's quite a lot earlier in some places. But then they pick up this change, right? And when exactly it is, and where but a little bit later. So, by the t so then you get the later Iron Age, but by, by, by um, the 10th century. Just if, can you both of you just help us? So what are the markers then, the distinctions between early versus late Iron Age? What are the archeologists using to make that distinction? Um, I understand your point and I think it's important. What you're saying is there should not be an assumption that the, le that the evidence indicates two different peoples. It could dif just indicate transitions in, in modes of living. Or, or they're, clearly, they're clearly seeing, uh, I think they are saying that they can clearly see that other people come into the area. Yes. But, but there's something about it, sort of what we know about history worldwide is other people come in and, but <laughs> the people who are there are also still there. So, still there. Yeah. so what happened, you know, there's, yeah. there's a process. Now the people who are still there I'm sorry, my language is inadequate because yeah. I haven't got a set of concepts to deal with this, but the people who are still there then carry forward a historical consciousness oh. about their, their originality, yeah, if you like, yeah. or their in situness. Well, so it yeah. gets very complex. So we do have to, I think, we have to see and, and, and take account of what the archaeologists have found. But as historians, I think we might want to do different things than what they do with the periodization. I think that's a very important point. I just wish now we had an archaeologist in the room because the, 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 the issue is about... Because now when you take the African... Sorry, Mirbo? Yes, I've got a brainwave on this point. Okay. Well, I might not be understanding um, Professor Huntington quite, quite clearly, but we are looking at the notion of migrants and an impact and versus indigenous response to new ideas. I think that is what we are looking at. 
and we are looking and is it Takazelo will have that? Is it Takazelo will have some families? Either they came in with the new knowledge and became specialists and were integrated. The inclusive world view. So we're going to have all the undercurrents of how is new knowledge produced and how are changes taken and how are they accepted and accommodated and localized. Yeah. So universal becomes local and we've got to bear in mind that sub theme which will be a thread running through, which is different from a takeover. Yeah. Which is different from a takeover. I don't know whether that is where we were. Yeah. That's where she's going. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, yes. I just want to remind us of the discussion yesterday about EMBO. Yes. Because I think that one of the, I mean, now I'm speak, really sort of flying by the seat of my pants here because this is not work that's being done. But I think there are real indications that, an, that a historical consciousness of airborne which is contained in Tagazero, very much so, and in complex ways, may well be one of the real indications of these earlier identities. So it, it, and I, I, I hear from so many people here in different ways and interest in this particular case study and I wonder if we shouldn't ask the organizers of the, the, cat, the catalytic uh, focus if they wouldn't if we wouldn't would like to have a working group take that particular identity forward because I think it would allow us then to address this periodization issue and it's a kind of deeply concrete possibility. Okay, I want to come back and ask Denver a question, but let's have the comment here first. Yes. Um, I would like to make a, a, all these uh, talks that we are, we are making, the contribution that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm receiving is, um, uh, it was one of, the, of my proposed when I, 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 I made the, the presentation at the first day. Because uh, I was looking for how do we use the knowledge uh, from the pre-colonial for education materials, and what I was proposing it, it was a, a kind of a community-based approach of the history of Africa, a community-based approach of the history of Mozambique, uh, and uh, I'm looking for that issue of of a, a community, a community meaning people, a space, uh, people coming. Uh, it, that issue of humanization of uh, uh, the people coming from Asia, people coming from U Europe, people leaving the, the Africa, leaving the African countries, uh, and link it with the present day identities of the people. Um, there is no um, dominance of uh, uh, colonialism has uh, a, 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 a evidence of before, after, and during. There is no Asians of before, after, and during. But we are losing in a, in, a, in a way that when we teach history, when we, we do test books for schools, we have a, a history of a, a community, a history of a community that uh, allow us to, to link with the present day identities. Because the many challenges that from uh, different academic research is the, how do we translate this knowledge into a comprehensive way for the children. How do we explain then that uh, the, the first farming com communities or the first, first farming agriculture are linked to present day identities? And I'm looking for the issue of uh, a, a understanding of community, has space, uh, people uh, coming and, and, and leaving the, the, the spaces as a way that we can go out of this uh, um, evidence of colonialism, Christianity and so on. That down, although there's, there is, of course, the other group that's dealing just with the methodological approach to to how do we do this, and a community-based history is, is is quite powerful because it is about making that link between what seems like this past and the fact that you are actually here. So, okay, um, I just want to to try to because and I will come back also to regionalizing now just when Denver answers this question because you see your uh, your question is important in relation to what Matisan is saying about the need and also it relates to your question incorporation is a seriously huge theme of African political development 
and it is an absent theme because a lot of historiography focuses on conflict and fragmentation. Mm. Mm. Whereas incorporation is a very important element of early and late independent African <laughs> change. Okay. <laughs> okay. So incorporation is tagazelo. These things are political um, and social uh, tools of analysis. They demonstrate incorporation and schism and reincorporation and so on. We literally, so part of that, so if you're telling me now, I'm just, I'm asking you to come to specifics. When we say early Iron Age, are we talking Iron Age as in evidence of the trade in iron rather than the production of iron? Production. Production. Okay, I want to come to that because production implies quite a different set of social realities to, to trading in the things, right? So if the case is, if then what you're saying to me is 6th century, is it what people are saying? Earlier. Earlier? But it, it depends on the region. I mean, immediately, you, if, once you say that, you're asking South Africans a, a question that's ex extremely explosive. Because you're saying, away with Bantu migrations, <laughs> as a thesis, in a sense. No. No, no explain. I don't, I don't think so at all. In fact, I think it concretizes that. Yeah. Because I think we need to get away, I personally, my own personal view, we need to get away from this idea that the migration was like the great trek, only it came yeah. from that side. Yeah. The migration took place over millennia, yeah. Uh, and it was on the basis of people uh, moving forward one generation at a time or families and at a time. And yeah, and backwards. And back, yeah. So I think it, it, it substantiates it rather than it, it, it negates it. It just it, what it what it does is it knocks on the head once and for all this idea that people moved down more or less yeah. at the same time and arrived at the Fish River yes. kind of scenario. And you know that's what makes the archaeology so interesting because the archaeologists doing this work in the 70s yeah. were quite subversive because they were deliberately trying to do away with this Bantu education thing that the black people arrived at the same time as white people. Yeah. But there are a lot of questions, as, as Carolyn saying, and, and that research has not been taken forward. And, uh, and that's the problem. Uh, for example, if you look at the site near, near, near Tabanguru, it's interesting in a number of ways. One, the question is, is asking is, what is the link between those 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 early farming settlements, because that's what they were, the early farming settlements that had a knowledge of smelting of iron, yeah. um, with the people that continue to live in that area. That's the one question. The other thing that you find in the archaeological record, and I'm not an archaeologist, this is just what I've been reading, yeah. is you often find the production of stone tools as well. Yes. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that there were people that previously only lived manufacturing stone tools were integrated with that society and living with them? or uh, does it mean there wasn't enough iron so they were, they were also producing stone tools? I mean, those are really important questions because it talks to uh, this, this, this idea that uh, African society assimilated people in a, in a way, you know, which also we tend to forget, uh, although we touch on it in, in different ways. Uh, I think that, uh, this, this concept of the Iron Age is really problematic. If we think of it in terms of early farming communities moving in who happen to have a knowledge of iron, then it becomes... Well, that, so, so my, my, my thing is I'm talking about the concept. I'm not comfortable with, with Bandu migrations because, first of all, the word Bandu. I mean, so I'm still in that, stuck in that yeah. problem. I'm literally still stuck at the word Bandu, and I need us to address that. Because the reason why I'm getting into that detail has to do with precisely the, the naming and the, back, the incorporations of people. So if, for example, we're still getting this notion, this I, attempt to separate the so-called Bushmen from other Africans is highly problematic. And more recently, the attempt to use the, 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 the take-up of Afrikaans by sand people as an attempt to Afrikanerize the sand, as if they are junior Afrikaners, is simply problematic. We can't allow this. So part of the thing is to deal with the ways in which Africans do these movements. Bantu migrations is problematic for its separation of Africans, but correct in its understanding of the movement of Africans. So those terminologies are haunting us. Sorry, yes. Since you're interested in the textbook question, 
I, I want to raise something that really worries me in the textbooks, and that is the thick black lines. So when you yeah, so you get these maps with the, these thick black lines drawn, and what is the what is the the the, the, student, the scholar? What does the pers young person make of these thick black lines? Because it, the complexity of the social process that's involved in a change, when in fact people with this, this somehow there's a movement, or there's a, something that the a signature that the archaeologists are picking up that is similar north of the Limpopo, and now you're seeing it a little bit later in time, south of the Limpopo. The meaning of that, when translated into a thick black line, is just impossible for the student to to, to grasp. And I, I think that the, these thick black lines have to be really seriously rethought because they, they, all of us have been subjected to those thick black lines. Even it was a great trick, lines going up. And they, those vi the visuals stay imprinted in your mind, and they're very hard to escape. <coughs> so okay, so I know that uh, I know it is with Amanda um, Stirrison at Vitz that she also as an archaeologist. Now she's like she seems to me like strictly an archaeologist, <laughs> you know, and she seems to she her pet hate is the concept of the hunter gatherer as not being a farmer. Because her work seems to imply that hunter-gatherers moved in and out of farming type things. So she says she hates the way we depict hunter-gatherers as singularly hunter-gatherers. Because she's like, well, maybe at some point they also chose to be in a farming community and then left the farming community. So she wants us to also depict typically phenotypically those who are sand and koi also involved in farming type of work. Like, that's her thing. But I understand why she hates that because I think the evidence is telling archaeologists that people are doing whatever is best to survive by. So let's go to regionalizing the histories. So if you have a specific comment around that, let's do that with, and, and, and try and... Uh, thank you, Matisan. Um, we, 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 we tend to think that make finality of findings of an archaeological escapade that took place. <laughs> and we are not mindful of the fact that there are multiple other sites that have not been opened. So if Deva tells us about Dabangulu 7th and 8th century, I want to remind him about Mzonjani, not far from Deben and it's third and fourth century settled communities. It's, it's, it's much earlier. That's the first point. The second point I want to make is about this absolute division between groups, the exclusivity that's, that's part, that comes from that notion of exclusivity. So if you, you are a hunter-gatherer, you are born a hunter-gatherer, and you die one. Um, now I'm going to, 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 to quote a, a reference to make my point valid. <laughs> Respect <laughs> Ebba. Liechtenstein travels at the end of the 18th century, and I find this is quite interesting, and he, 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 he touches up to the orange, and there he finds people who actually speak Sikosa, and one of them actually says, you know, I am royalty, I am from the Ndambe house, and <coughs> he notes this, and he says, he's got a lazy eye, like the family of the Ndambe's there, but they are hunters. He is royalty and has thrown away his status, and, and he's thrown away his status, and he's walk, is, is up and down the, 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 the equally. And to, to confirm the point, he says he is like the house of the Lambe's eye. So, and up to now, Aman Lambe have got a small eye, eye, eye of that house. <laughs> they got the eye that looks as an identified end of the 18th century. So, the, the movement between modes of production is, is, is much more open. Yes. And we cannot operate from the oh, final point. Yes. Uh, final point, final point. I'm a saint. <laughs> so now um, 
Nobody has a replacement for that terrible term, Bandu Migrations. Can we deal with that term quickly? Then my day will be made. Bandu Migrations must change too. What are we dealing with here? Processes of incorporation. In my paper that I was presenting yesterday, part of, well, was it yesterday, yeah, part of my argument is precisely that that's what the clan is Tagazelo, geologists, conceptually do for you. They're about explaining how people are culturally incorporated. Even if it's a violent process or even if it's a devious process, it doesn't matter. The point is incorporation becomes the... Um, the other thing, of course, is what um, um, Prof. Fanola was talking about, the ritual archive. The archive that is not of the things that are written or said. Why we practice the practices we have, whether they are nice or not nice, whatever they are, whether we still do them or not do them. So incorporation, for example, my sense as a, somebody who I think has kind of peasant consciousness, even though I've become suburban, is, <laughs> I have become suburban, um, what peasant consciousness does, or let's call it rural South African consciousness or rural consciousness, is it tends to imply that we must be very incorporative somehow. It, it leads you in that direction. So when I got married in the Eastern Cape, my entire family, the instinct is, then we must go and see them. We must. The entire Mkiza family now comes down by bus. Thousands of kilometers or however long, 700, 800 kilometers, old people. They just want to see who are now our relatives. This is what they want to do. They want to scope them out and see, now we have become relatives. <coughs> and it is one of the problems, of course, of black tax. You just see it in our economic practice. You must incorporate. You must incorporate, even if capitalism is not allowing you. You must incorporate. So the, 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 the consciousness which we are left with is that consciousness of incorporation. Of course, in the township, it's completely smashed, <laughs> that consciousness. Not completely, but sometimes when I go to townships, I'm just not a township person, yet. No, I'm too rural for townships. But that sense, that, 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 that consciousness of incorporation, and that is the archive that we, that conscious, the archive of our consciousness. So that concept of the clan names as part of mythical, uh, the mytho-historical era, what we must, so if we can extract from the Greeks demos, we must extract from Isindu, uh, the concept of incorporation. Ubushobo, ukwakiobo ubushobo. I'll come back. Uh, th thanks very much. So, I think that one of the on the ritual, um, um, let's call it the ritual archive. I think that one can can really make an argument which says that the study of the periods that we're interested in have been hampered by a particular concept of archive. And a particular concept of archive, it goes something like this, and this is the quick version, okay, so forgive the crudeness of it, but the quick version goes like this. You put the stuff in the archive and it's immobilized, it's preserved, therefore you can trust it, right? So first of all, that, that if you put the documentary archive under scrutiny, that pr single proposition does not hold up, because you, you can see the change that the documents go through. Then something that's been called oral traditions is posed as an opposite and rendered as though it's unreliable because the oral tradition is imagined as something which changes, right? So it changes over time through faulty memory or whatever. So you get an opposition set up in the scholarship between the frozen, uh, uh, the frozen reliable archive and the dynamic, slightly unreliable um, oral tradition. But in fact, so in, and you can absolutely show that the, the written archive is not stable in that way. It's, it changes in all sorts of ways. But once you start unpacking the idea of oral traditions, you start saying, well, what are we actually talking about here? You find elements such as that which is attached to ritual, or is tagazelo, in which there are profound protocols of preservation. You can't mess with the stuff. Now, it's true that they just like with the written archive, bits of, bits of those, uh, those materials do get changed, but other bits can't get changed because people rec will recognize the change and feel that it's really dangerous for relations with the ancestors. So there are protocols, if you like, 
just like the protocols in the archive. And until we get to make this argument that that division of the reliable versus the unreliable, the frozen versus the malleable, we're, we're, we're always uh, um, kind of bound into an earlier conception. So the, the ritual archive and how it works as an archive is something that is going to bear lots and lots of consideration. I see Prof. Fetane is so quiet. Where is he? The anthropologist. <laughs> Put your head up. You're so quiet. <laughs> there he is. OK. Yeah. Thanks, Kabazel. your work. I'm not, I'm not quite sure whether I'm responding to, to, the, to the concern that you are raising, but I'm attempting to um, by responding in the fashion that, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm one with you in saying that, um, you know, the, the Bantu migration is quite a misnomer because, after all, we are a Bantu. That begins there. And, 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 and to designate a particular group as that is problematic. But, of course, Behind that, there is always a particular objective and a motive and an agenda to do that. So my simple response, uh, without being simplistic, is that if we speak migrations, it, they are African. And again, we, we, should, we should insist on that because even the, 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 the demarcation of Africa between um, uh, Saharan and Sub-Saharan and all that is not our making, right? And there was also there an ideological agenda um, to present it in that fashion because it was an attempt to dislocate, you know, to make, uh, even though Egypt is geographically African, it is culturally not African. So to, to, to drive that wedge in, um, which is not working, and we're grateful in this regard to Sheikh Hunter Dio, who came up with the cultural unit of Black Africa. But having said that, you see, um, with, the Africans, with the Africans in the West, for instance, that is the West of Africa, we, we learn that the people that, were, that are in present day Ghana uh, came from, from here. But the reality could be that their point of departure was, again, East Africa, they came down. And we've been moving all the time. I just need to emphasize that point. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm making, I'm using now the term African, consciously so, because there have been scholars such as Mutimbe, Mazrui, um, Damamdani, and all of them, uh, who for some reason have bowed down um, to the claim that Africa itself is not our indigenous is, is not our indigenous <laughs> name, um, that uh, it comes from somewhere else. But now, and we 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 okay, and, and I'm referring people to the book uh, Gerard Messi, and he was not making this argument for one way or the other. But in the beginnings, uh, Gerard Messi has come before uh, James Prestead in terms of looking at Kemet. He states that the name Africa is in fact African. It, it traces it to here to us having been having us named ourselves and i'm curious to hear what uh, our sister here would say regarding the name mozambique itself Musa because bin Bik. yeah musa bin big thank you very Musa much bin musa is bin big and and it's from arabic yes, it's not arabic. even arab it's not even islamic yes it's arabic musa bin big and so we celebrate that we think that we have become independent mozambicans and yet we've just exchanged you know, one cultural master for the other. So, in, in, in trying to decolonize ourselves, we've got to be conscious against this. Sure. I'm going to ask you uh, one last question to just uh, upset all of you. Does it matter the degree to which we have taken Musa bin Bik or uh, the fact that Swahili is a syncretic, uh, it's a, what's it, a, a creolized, where do we, does it matter that this, after all, I mean, after all, all these people have our DNA, all these people, they have our DNA, why, why, why? I'm just asking, yes, I'm just answering, yeah, <laughs> I'm just answering, <laughs> it, matters, it matters a lot, yes. if voluntarily, yes. freely so, yes. without any pressure, I would like to adopt the name Andrew. You know, I love this name. Without any sense of inferiority complex, without any pressure, then that's good. But there's a serious problem. If I adopt Andrew, because I think that that name Andrew is, is much more Christian than Simpiwe. If I adopt Suleiman, because I think that the Arabic name is more Islamic. So it matters a lot that we are named 
by others. It matters a lot that we think we are re-embracing ourselves only to realize that uh, you know we have embraced another form. That's why I'm very cautious um, with, with the term Azania itself, because right? Because it, that has got to be seriously interrogated. But recently I found out, and that is not enough, that um, right up there there was there was a name, there was a place uh, one of the one of the leaders in in, in ancient uh, Kemet uh, was uh, Aze not Aza but Aze Nia and that in fact at once it's just like the question the case of Ghana there was a country in the east of Africa that was Azania but what it means is important for instance I'm not excited by the fact that the name Sudan you know means the black land and yet it is in Arab and yet it is in, in Arabic that the Arabs decided that this is the black land we must not we must not be decided upon we cannot uh, you know uh, uh, delegate our thinking capacity to other people okay people of the <laughs> yes, um, I think that uh, there is an issue of go back in history and try to contextualize yes. uh, the emergence of uh, all those names. Yes. Uh, we are talking about Mossad, Mossad being big, and how we adopt this Mossad being big. And sometimes there are political pressure and there are emotions that we quickly need. The, the, we, we, I mean, we as a, a, a people, a, a people in a country, a political people that we need to make a decision in adopting a name. And this is not only regarding to external influence uh, from Asia or from Europe, it's inside our communities. I will go back in the, uh, uh, creating, work, naming the city, the capital of Mozambique, uh, Maputo. Maputo is a, 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 a name of a kingdom that is not on Maputo. It's far from Maputo. Was probably the, the name that was to be adopted was Mfumo. But maybe the leaders on that time, they were more uh, shifted to that side of Maputo. So a, a, a different uh, story, I mainly there are political issues on the naming of, of, of those places. If we want to go back and, and, and inquire if they actually on the, how our present position they are uh, uh, fair or not yeah let me read uh, just the what the oh sorry one last comment here comment? yeah just if you can switch on your mic if it works yeah. it's a bit uh, awkward now to be addressing the chair there and having my voice travel in that direction, so I hope I'm doing both at the same time. Uh, I have been uh, somewhat in a, a struggle with uh, uh, the struggle that the forum has of trying to, well, the word periodization also came up, and trying to, 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 to think in terms of periods and to think in terms of uh, the concept of uh, 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 colonization and colonialism. Uh, the, the professor said clearly that we can never or we must never forget colonialism. And uh, we must do that in order to arrive at the point where we want to mm. look at the, the conceptualizing of the pre-colonial uh, uh, of, of, of the pre-colonial. Now, I find that we have been vacillating. At one stage, you mentioned earlier, we talked, uh, you talked about the, the 11th century, and then uh, a few minutes later, uh, about the 17th and 18th century. And I think it's part of the, the struggle that we had to confine ourselves to, to what we really want to, to look at. And uh, that we have not reached that point, we haven't reached that, that space. Uh, because I think that we must look, in order to, to understand what we want to understand about pre-colonialism, we have to look at the concept of colonialism uh, which has uh, uh, 
which acquired a philosophical, a philosophical content. It has uh, 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 historical concepts. Uh, 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 it also has uh, ideological and political meaning uh, and understandings. And from there we need to, I think, uh, or we should have uh, uh, gone to try to understand the conceptualization of the, of the pre-colonial time. In, uh, yes, we did, we did speak about the early Iron Age and the late Iron Age and so on. Uh, if we take uh, the life of the inhabitants of the early times, uh, yeah, because we also mentioned that, uh, hey, let, let's forget about the rest of Africa and let's uh, localize our, our investigation into this. Uh, people who had a, a, a social organization, they had an economy, they had a way of life, they had a political life, and uh, they, they were also those cross migrations throughout uh, the, the Southland and uh, people who were uh, in contact, close contact with nature. And uh, if we take, for example, the, the strand loopers, if we go to uh, what we find along the coast, especially with the uh, proliferation of, of of shell middens <coughs> along the coast from here to uh, all the way up to, to the east coast, which is evidence of, of the people uh, who lived here. The strand lopers were there with their way of life. And uh, with their way of life, they, they left the footprint. They left the footprint of who they were and uh, uh, how they lived and so on. I just wanted to to mention that. Now, uh, the the term that came up about Bushmen uh, was also problematic for us in a sense. But I also know that Bushmen and Ottentot were, were were the same people at at different times, depending on the economy or the economic situation. And they would move between uh, pastoralism and, uh, yeah. And uh, I also know that the name or the term Bushman for themselves is used by the Bushman uh, and they want to be Bushma. And uh, there are those that insist that they're nothing else than uh, a Bushman. Uh, because that was now adopted and, and, and accepted and embraced. Thank you. Uh. Yes, I think it's important to recognize that designate that for some people who call themselves Bushmen, there's a reason why they do so. That is a re there's a specific political reason they adopt that particular name. That of, that, that, I, I, but I think it, 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 it's people who must have the right to name themselves. I, I, I certainly don't think most of us would be comfortable with it because of how, what it looks from our angle, because of the history. But at the same time, those people have to name themselves, they have chosen to name themselves that. Uh, we finished it. Thank you so much. I have been told to end the session. <laughs> <laughs>